day in San Francisco means another day at the 2019 AGU Fall Meeting. There's lots of coverage coming your way. AGU TV starts now. Hello and welcome to day four of AGU TV. I'm your host, Juliette Goodrich. What an exciting week it's been here at AGU. We've covered the big events and spoken with the biggest names, but we're not done yet. Joining us now is Stella Bowles, and she has done work on the LaHave River Cleanup Project, um, and you have quite a catchy title for it. Why don't we start with that? Yeah, so I named my project, Oh Poop, It's Worse Than I Thought. And it Say that again. Oh Poop, It's Worse Than I <laughs> Thought. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> Tell me about your project. Yeah, so my grade six science fair project, all grade sixes in Nova Scotia have to have a science fair project. So mine was testing the LaHave River for fecal bacteria. And it started because I wanted to swim in the river, but my mom always said, you know, no, it's dirty, you can't do that. But we live right along the river, and I see it every day I drive along. My mom drives me to school, my dad, and I see the river every day, and I just wanted to jump right in, but my mom always told me, no, it's dirty, you can't swim. So when we did the testing, and I got my results back, and realized you can't get the water in contact with your skin, it's so disgusting and contaminated, that I wanted to tell the community that it's not safe because the government wasn't saying anything. What can we learn from that and from what you did moving forward? I definitely think that youth have a voice. I asked my mom for a Facebook page when I was 11 to tell the community that the river's dirty and it's not safe. And my mom said no. So we compromised and we put up a big sign in front of our home right along our busy highway and it said this river's contaminated with fecal bacteria. And after that we had the media at the door asking us why do you have this sign? Why, why is that there? And then after we had People contacting us, mom decided that we could have a Facebook page and let the community know that it's not safe to swim in the river. And after that, it went kind of worldwide. And it was an issue that a lot of people talked about really fast. And there's actually 15.7 million Canadian dollars to clean up our river now. Amazing. And you did win an award for this, we should mention. Um, and this sets the example and the stage for young scientists. So what advice would you give them, given that you were asking the question, why? I definitely encourage youth or young adults to ask a lot of questions because so much can happen from questioning. I also encourage people to find mentors because I found a mentor down the road, Dr. David Maxwell. He helped me test the water. He showed me how to do it and he gave me so many good pointers and tips for life and really that's how we have to go about life now and find people that can help us answer our questions. Have you seen changes, positive changes since your study? Yeah, so along the LaHaye River, people have straight pipes. So it's a pipe from a home's toilet directly into the water. And there's no filtration, so anything you flush is going directly into the water. There are 600 along the LaHaye River, but now with this project, with $15.7 million Canadian, these pipes are going to be removed and replaced with septic systems. So there have been about 150 replaced out of the 600. And by 2023, it should be straight pipe free, the LaHaye. I have a feeling your work doesn't stop here. What are you doing now? I've actually been to Sweden and I've trained youth there to test their own waterway because the way I did my testing, I did it right in my kitchen. I grow fecal bacteria in my basement. So I was showing youth not only in Nova Scotia but in Sweden that science can be fun, it can be hands-on learning. And they found out over there that it's also an issue that fecal contamination is in their water as well. And Stella, I know you've won so many awards for your work. Why don't you talk about some of the highlights for you? I definitely think the biggest award I won was the Meritorious Service Medal from the Governor General of Canada. It's from Julie Payette. She was an astronaut. She's been in outer space. And I can now sign my name Stella Bowles MSM, which I like to use in my papers at school because <laughs> I'm only 15 and that's it's kind of fun for my teachers <laughs> to see. Well, thank you for asking the question why and following up and also doing our interview with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.
Let's now start our daily tour of scientific universities and institutions around the globe. Three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Over 50 years ago, the Apollo 8 mission launched to the moon in December of 1968. As part of this mission, three astronauts were able to capture an iconic image of the Earth rising over the moon known as Earthrise. This image inspired a generation of environmental activism starting with Earth Day and decades of environmental activism since. The NASA Goddard Space Flight Center's Earth Science Division is the largest collection of Earth scientists on the planet. And our job is to be the nation's trusted source of comprehensive environmental information about the current state and the future of the Earth. We build, design, launch, and operate scientific missions, including satellites, airborne campaigns on aircraft, as well as ground campaigns to understand how the Earth works and how to predict how the Earth will change in the future. Goddard developed two space-based LIDARs that have launched in the, the past year, those being JEDI, which is used to measure the vegetation, structure of the Earth, and ISAT-2, which measures, among other things, vegetation, atmosphere, ocean, and changes in the ice cover. With ISAT-2, uh, we're just starting to see the, the first year of data. So what we've seen is the thickness of the ice and the, the Arctic change over the course of the year. So we've seen it at its minimum, and we saw the ice grow uh, to its maximum extent uh, in March and maximum thickness. Uh, what we've seen, too, is that thickness, it's a lot less than it was in prior decades. So it's about half as thick as it was, say, in the 80s. So we've seen a substantial change in the ice. Uh, we've also started measuring ice in the summer with ISAT-2 and looking to get, can we see how thick that ice is? It's a procedure to be able to do that, and this is brand new data. Uh, that we're just first seeing with ISAT-2. From our vantage point from space, we have a global perspective on the role of fires in the Earth system. We see landscapes where fires are increasing, especially in places where there's plenty of fuel to burn. Warmer and drier climate means those fires can grow faster, get larger, and blow their smoke further downwind, impacting communities not just in the locations where fires burn, but people thousands of miles away. NASA has more than 20 satellites on orbit right now, and each of them help us tell the part of the story about how fire changes the Earth system. We are the first to detect fires burning in remote locations with satellites that observe the location and the intensity of fires. We're also then tracking the smoke and the way the smoke from fires blows to impact not just local communities, but people that could live thousands of miles away. Fires in California, for example, in 2017, sent their smoke as far east as New England. Those trace gases and the aerosols that fires release then changed our entire planet. And so at NASA, scientists like myself are responsible for not just finding those fires, but tracking the impacts they have on ecosystems and the consequences of those fires in our atmosphere. NASA has been studying ozone from space for about 40 years now. We have nearly daily global measurements of ozone since 1979. Science is showing us that the Montreal Protocol is an effective treaty and it's working as intended. And I think that's fantastic news for all of us on the whole planet. We learned that if you look at the HCL, hydrochloric acid measurements, during certain conditions inside the ozone hole, and then you track those conditions each year, you can make a measurement of whether or not the chlorine is going down. And it turns out that as the chlorine goes down, we're seeing the amount of ozone depletion going down right along with it. So the two are tracking together. And that gives us confidence that this treaty is successful and it's working as intended. The ocean is absolutely immense and it's very difficult to be all places at all times. This is where satellites come in. There is a fleet of Earth observing satellites hosted by NASA that view the global ocean every two days. The PACE mission uh, is NASA's Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem mission, scheduled for launch in December of 2022. It is NASA's next big investment in the combined study of the oceans and the atmospheres. 
From the oceans, it's designed to improve our ability to discriminate and identify phytoplankton community structure, in particular, their evolution in time and space. Satellites give us about six million observations of weather every six hours, so that's a whole lot of data. One of the things at NASA that we do is try to do a good job of merging all of that data with a model field. That's the starting point of a weather forecast, and that helps us improve the way that we can predict weather, that improves the way that we get weather forecasts on our phone and, and improves our lives a little bit every day. NASA plays a really critical role in that because we understand satellites probably as well as anyone in the world. And so we can really pioneer and get new types of data into those weather forecasts and make sure that that helps us improve uh, forecasts for everyone going forward. Being at Goddard is absolutely incredible. It's one of the greatest um, collection of Earth scientists in the world. And so the access we have to each other is just, in my mind, unparalleled. There are so many really smart people that know, that have expertise in so many different areas of atmospheric chemistry, dynamics, in measurements, in modeling. It's a fast moving uh, group of people, but it's always changing and it's a whole lot of fun to be a part of all that energy. NASA's Artemis mission is an opportunity to look back at Earth and regain that sense of awe and wonder that we had with the Earthrise photo that inspired our environmental movement. Spatial sciences really is the combined theory, practice, and technologies that enable people to address substantive issues through the lens of spatial data, measures, and modeling. When we think about health issues, when we think about globalization, when we think about um, these ideas of urbanization, and we think about issues with our environment, all of these big topics uh, leverage the science of where spatial sciences in order to assist in solving those problems. Spatial Sciences Institute was founded in 2010 and it's housed in the Dana and David uh, Dornsythe College of Letters, Arts and Sciences. From the get-go, the vision was that it would be cross-cutting in terms of how it introduced spatial sciences to students and the kinds of uh, research projects and portfolios that we built. We're an interdisciplinary group of faculty at USC. Really where our mission is at USC is to spatially enable the university is the way we like to think of it. We bring that interdisciplinary um, join of, of computer science and geography into these other disciplines to hopefully ultimately help them transform the world into a better place. Even within spatial sciences, our faculty are very diverse. We're going to have a political scientist, a, a human geographer, a biologist, and a geophysicist all within the same academic unit. My background is in spatial statistics and tectonophysics. I'm a researcher at ESRI, Environmental Systems Research Institute. I'm involved in creating new tools, especially for the spatial statistics team that a city planner can use, but also a climatologist can use. Spatial machine learning allows us to represent space in a way that generic machine learning methods cannot, so that we can actually understand a simple message, a simple story from terabytes or picobytes of data. I'm interested in studying atmospheric pollution and ocean pollution. In an ideal world, if you see pollution, uh, drop a pen and share that data with everybody, uh, because know that it'll be used by someone at some point can actually build that cognitive system for our planet so that we can better our planet faster. I'm uh, an active duty Army officer for 30 years and in that life I did a lot of work providing safe and secure communities using some of these very dynamic current technologies in the spatial sciences. I'm working with the folks in the international relations community, the folks in public policy, the folks in political science. We work on projects where we use a lot of the more current technologies and satellite imaging, so small sats as they're often used and termed, and bringing that data, a very current, real data of the world, and then from that, figuring out what's actually happening on a place of the Earth that is not seen by many people. When we think about human rights violations, uh, these are ways of communicating that to the decision makers so that they can make policy or take action. Some of the work that we're doing here is tracking village burnings in Myanmar as a result of the genocide that started in 2017. 
the places where these human rights atrocities are happening are data deserts. We don't have any data on them. What we do is take data from these new, really cheap satellites that are able to cover the entire Earth daily. We aim for our students to be able to contextualize the geographic information and the spatial information and analytics that they gain here to use geographic knowledge to affect change. We've built a series of academic programs that, that include us and complementary kinds of training. So at the undergraduate level we have a due design degree that's a collaboration between spatial sciences, public policy and the School of Architecture. Students also have the opportunities through spatial sciences to work on research, either through independent research with faculty or through team projects that we have in conjunction with maybe the county. I was in the geodesign major and I am now working at an architecture firm downtown. The multidisciplinary nature of the program was a huge asset for me. It helps people make more informed design decisions, it helps craft better project narratives, it helps advocate for better choices when you're presenting to a client. I'm a scientific applications software engineer in the suborbital radar science and engineering group at JPL. I did the MS in spatial data science program. In the past, people have come to these positions from either a spatial or GIS background or they've come to it from a computer science background, where in reality they need both skill sets. The spatial data science degree provided me with the perfect skill set to do what I do now. We want to leave our students with a really good grounding in spatial thinking. We've helped them find the places where they can apply uh, maps and, and different physical and human data together in an, in an interwoven way. They're in the real estate industry, now they have a much better understanding of, of location, location, location. Or if they're in uh, the public health field, they have a much better understanding of how to trace an epidemic, for example. When I think of the, the sort of the grand challenges in the world, it's climate change, species extinctions, freshwater availability, and then the rising inequalities. Spatial sciences, it has a piece that has to do with theory and a piece that has to do with practice and a piece that has to do with technology. You bring in all of these other complementary fields with their expertise and perspectives on how to, how to address some of these problems. Then we have a hope of making a real difference. The Water Resources Group at Washington State University is focused on understanding hydrologic systems and bringing innovation and solutions to problems that we see with water quantity and water quality. These are highly tied to the climate change effects we see happening now and into the future and associated land use change. Because these systems that we study are very complex, they involve decision making with humans, we also interact a lot with people who study economics, sociology and the associated political implications of that. And because of this work, we automatically integrate it back into our own work and we do a lot of integrated hydrologic modeling with that. Climate change is impacting the Columbia River Basin. The Columbia River is critical for irrigated agriculture, for hydropower generation, for several fish species that are endangered. Our precipitation is falling primarily during the wintertime as snow and this stores up in the snowpack and, and then is released in the summertime for summer water use. And so what we're worried about with climate change is that warming will cause a reduction of the snowpack and that will therefore reduce summer water availability and cause an increasing uh, frequency and magnitude of droughts. So we're doing quite a bit of research to identify solutions for this problem. With the reduction of snowpack as a storage, we're looking to other types of storage. There is there is some artificial or reservoir storage in the Columbia River Basin, but it's limited compared to other watersheds. It can only hold about 30% of the mean annual flow in these reservoirs. And so we're looking to other types of storages, and one of those is groundwater as a storage system. The problem is that this needs to be done in a sustainable way. The focus of my work in the Water Resources Group is to characterize large hydrologic systems. So I'm really interested in understanding how humans are using and impacting groundwater bodies. 
I use a diversity of tools to do this from satellite remote sensing to individual citizens monitoring their own groundwater. Ultimately, I'm interested in answering how much water do we have, how much water do we use, and how much water do we need? Well, I would say that groundwater quality is important and it goes hand in hand with quantity because as you are reducing quantity, you start to care more about the quality. And the only way that we can think about quality is by understanding how it actually flows in the subsurface, what kinds of things it's picking up, how it's interacting with different things that are out there. And especially with groundwater, because it ha it's been in the ground for so long, it's got residence time of thousands of years. So whatever has been going on, whatever things that it's been collecting and interacting with, that's what makes the quality important. Some of the concerns about groundwater contaminants are that they can come from just about anywhere. Depending on what you plan on using the water for determines whether or not something is really a contaminant or whether or not it is just something that's moving with the water. So there are going to be things that are naturally dissolved in the water, like uh, certain types of metals that are in your drinking water that are totally fine, but at high concentrations those can start to become a bit of a problem. Things that we're a little bit more concerned about have to do with what we would call anthropogenic contaminants, and those are ones that humans have put into the environment. So these can include things like fertilizers, these could be fuel additives, uh, these could also be things that are naturally occurring that are stimulated by something that we put in the environment. So bacteria would be one of those. So many lakes in our region are showing signs of, uh, of impairment. And it's, it's clear that these, uh, these lakes in the summertime are almost green with algae and have high vegetation growth. The smaller lakes are showing this earlier than the bigger lakes. And the, the reason for it is that many more people are using the lakes, their recreation on the lake and living around the lake, and the lakes are warming due to higher temperatures. The problems that we see with the, the bigger lakes is that we are probably not understanding that the little lakes are early warning systems for them. We need to understand the causes and we are doing research on those causes and one of them is groundwater flow to lakes. Once groundwater is already highly contaminated, it takes a long time to reverse that effect. My experience working with WSU's Engineers Without Borders has been great. When I was in Panama as a Peace Corps volunteer after graduating from WSU, I was trying to solve a problem in the community. They wanted water year round. And I didn't see how that could be done with the resources that they had. I thought what they really needed was information about their groundwater resource, but that information wasn't available from any local agency. So over phone conversations and email conversations with Dr. Carl Olson, one of my past professors here at the university, uh, Engineers Without Borders was created. And since then, they've been back on two, soon to be three trips to Panama. They've mapped the community. They've been able to see the resources on firsthand. Uh, we've installed a solar powered pump system for that serves about 200 people. And we're planning on building a community outreach center in the capital of the reservation I was living in to just keep on going. I see quite a few challenges, but also opportunities when I look ahead at groundwater work in the future. The biggest challenge is just raising awareness that groundwater is a crucial part of our water cycle and also a crucial part of the water supply that we use every day. I think the more we can help people understand that when you turn on the tap, that water is not just coming from the rivers that we can see, but also the aquifer systems beneath, the better we'll be at planning and managing this resource in the future. The space industry is growing and exciting because of the exciting discoveries in space, in the outer planets, and especially in exoplanets, that we are not alone in the universe. The Center for Materials of the Universe, part of Arizona State University, is a new center that I'm leading. I'm Alexandra Navratsky, Alex for short. The center's mission is to foster research and collaboration, not just at ASU, but among many institutions, to bring together science and engineering, to further our understanding of space, 
our use of space and technological advances. My research deals with the stability of materials in a thermodynamic sense that's uh, technical. In a practical sense, one wants to know whether materials can form, whether they persist, and what they tell us about the environment, the conditions under which they formed. Uh, my name is Arunima Singh and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physics here at ASU. At the center, I'll be using ab initio simulations to study the uh, possible structures which could exist on exoplanets. Uh, these are new conditions. Uh, we have extremely hazardous conditions on the exoplanets, extreme temperatures and pressures which can only be probed using computations. But also we can perform control experiments in lab but they're prohibitively expensive and time-consuming. And the computations allow us to map a very huge complex phase space, uh, studying millions of structures. In the next 10 to 20 years, our hope as a group uh, in the center of the materials of the universe is to map the planetary genome. We want to be able to map out uh, the structure and properties of materials which could exist on these exoplanets and in the universe. I'm Scott Sayers. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Molecular Sciences. So my research lab is an ultra-fast laser lab, which means we use lasers to study chemical reactions and dynamics. We are developing new spectroscopic tools to push the time limits to shorter and shorter timescales, where we're now able to see electron dynamics in their native timescale. And this gives us access to all sorts of new information for materials. In the future, I believe that we're going to be able to make new materials and coatings out of depositing clusters onto a surface. And so instead of having a surface that has a couple of catalytically active sites, we're going to be able to make this entire material chemically active and be able to retain those properties, those unique properties that we observed uh, from the individual cluster sites. My name is Dan Shem. I'm a mineralogist and I'm a high pressure experimentalist. So I have a uh, um, lab that studies materials at high pressure and high temperature conditions of the Earth interior and other planets. So planetary interiors are one of the hardest regions to understand because we cannot get that data directly. Um, I simulate the pressure temperature conditions of the deep interior in the lab. For the next 10 or 20 years, I will enjoy studying a very wide pressure temperature range, very wide compositional range, to be able to understand the planets that we never have thought about before. My name is Joseph O'Rourke. I am a planetary scientist, and my research focuses on phenomena that originate deep within the interiors of planets. My research is exciting because it focuses on big picture questions about Earth and other planets in our solar system and beyond. Why does Earth have plate tectonics? Why does Earth have a magnetic field? These large-scale planetary processes are essential to understanding why our surface is habitable. So we are entering a new era of planetary exploration. Most of NASA's past spacecraft missions have focused on the most easily observable parts of planets, their surfaces and their atmospheres. But uh, the new generation of NASA missions is focused on collecting data about the interiors of planets. The NASA InSight mission is probing the interior of Mars. The NASA Psyche mission, led by ASU, is going to the remnant core of an ancient protoplanet. And so we are starting to gather new data about the interiors of planets, which makes understanding the properties of materials even more of a pressing need. I'm Hilary Ellen Hartnett, and I'm Associate Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and the School of Molecular Sciences. I'm a geochemist. I also answer to oceanographer and astrobiologist, but my work is to understand carbon and nitrogen cycling on the Earth. And in particular, I'm interested in how minerals catalyze organic reactions in Earth systems. The collaboration between material scientists mineral physicists and geochemists can explore the conditions and the chemical properties that might be present on exoplanets. Nobody thinks that organic chemists will be able to tell us something about pH, or temperature, or redox chemistry for a planet around another star, but I think we're going to be able to do that. The Center for the Materials of the Universe has nothing less than the vision of understanding the universe. We envision that the connections with material scientists and geochemists and even astrophysicists is going to allow us to think about new, creative, interdisciplinary ways to explore planets that we can't go to yet. So we hope to grow, we hope to thrive.
Google's very excited to be here at AGU. We're here talking about Google Earth and Google Earth Engine, our remote sensing analysis platform. We have uh, our partners here giving talks in our booth, uh, AGU presenters who have done amazing work using our tools, and uh, we want to give them a stage to, uh, to talk about it. Thermo Scientific is, since 60 years or so, very interactive and part of the community. As Thermo Fisher is uh, the biggest uh, instrument, scientific instrument manufacturer on this planet, we this year wanted to show the whole bandwidth what we can serve science in geosciences. Well, welcome to the University of Alaska Fairbanks Research Booth. We are the research arm of the University of Alaska. And we're very excited to be here. We have an exhibit that includes things from our museum, the Museum of the North, which is one of the top-notch museums in the world. You should come to Fairbanks and see it. We have the full support of the leadership of the University of Alaska Fairbanks as the research arm. They want us here. We want to be here. We like to inter interact with people at AGU. Come see us, and if you miss us this year, we'll be back next year. LIDOS is here at AGU this year because we support the National Science Foundation and the researchers that they send to Antarctica. So what we do is we provide the support staff in Antarctica, we provide the logistical supply chain to get people and their equipment to Antarctica so that they can do research uh, either in Antarctica or about Antarctica as a, a place that's commuted with the rest of the world. We're sharing uh, the story about what the National Science Foundation does particularly in Antarctica uh, with hopes that maybe researchers will contribute their proposals to NSF to bring their science uh, to Antarctica, but also we're hoping that folks will come work for us as well because we need support staff in Antarctica as well. Sierra Nevada is really in an unsustainable state. We know that it's, it's burning. Uh, every year we get wildfires that consume tens to hundreds of thousands of acres. Over 100 million trees that suffered mortality, tree deaths during the last uh, most recent drought. Our institute addresses resource management challenges in the region and also enables our faculty and students to use the region as a natural laboratory for research. My research is looking at the water balance of the Sierra Nevada. I'm very interested in knowing what California's water supply is going to be. So we're very interested when precipitation comes down, either as snow or as rain, how much of that actually ends up in the river. We can make better decisions if we understand the, the system well. And the problem with working up in the mountains is that it's very difficult to get measurements. And we've been sprinkling devices such as wireless sensor network around the Sierra Nevada um, because we can actually measure snow depth using this instrument. Um, we tend to have on it, we can we radio out the, the signal so we have it in real time. We also have information, other measurements such as relative humidity and temperature so we can actually start doing energy balance calculations as well. I'm a plant biologist and I'm interested in the way that plants and particularly trees are responding to environmental change. So climate has already shifted a good bit in California since the early 20th century. Most of the state has gotten hotter. The northern part of the state is getting more precipitation than it used to. The southern part is getting less. And all of that can have some profound impacts on tree populations. As many people know, during the recent drought in 2012 to 2016, there was a lot of tree mortality uh, because this drought was one of the most severe that's been seen in the last thousand years. Uh, but those types of droughts are expected to become uh, more common in the future, and so those types of events may repeat. And even when you don't get these dramatic mortality events, the increases in temperature and drought have been leading to higher mortality just on an average year in both adults and uh, seedling trees uh, in many areas of the West. And that, coupled with the increase in wildfires from drier conditions, raises a lot of concerns that forests may not be able to regenerate themselves, that the young trees uh, will not be able to grow up fast enough to replace older trees 
species that are dying. And that, of course, can have a lot of uh, implications for carbon storage in these forests, for habitat, and for any other uses of these forest lands. So knowing how this variation is distributed in space, as well as what genetic variants are causing these differences between individuals, might allow us to better choose seed sources when we're reforesting after events like wildfires that will be better able to tolerate the conditions that we're going to see in the future. In my lab, we study soil organic matter dynamics, which is to say that uh, we study the biogeochemical cycles of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, in particular how those cycles are affected by physical perturbations in the environment, such as erosion, fire, or climate change, and focus in particular on how these changes then affect the ability of the soil system to store and stabilize uh, carbon and organic matter. One of the most important challenges facing humanity right now is soil degradation. And soil use and degradation just in the last 200 years or so has released 12 times more carbon to the atmosphere compared to the rate at which we're now annually releasing carbon. Some of the best ways that we can improve are reduced tillage, reduce disturbance from agricultural practices overall, reducing excessive use of agricultural chemicals, stopping deforestation, and putting back forests whenever possible, uh, promoting planting of per deep rooted perennial plants. All of those are proven methods that we've shown over the years that they can increase the amount of carbon stored in soil. I look at the historical experience of wildfire and what's driven extreme wildfires in the recent decades. And that includes changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, changes in snowmelt timing, changes in season length. And then we use that information to understand how fire may have responded in the past to climate and how it may respond in the future to climate. So best case for California is that we can aggressively manage our forests to make them much more resilient to climate change and get the fire out of the forest canopy and more often at the surface and lower intensity so the trees survive, maintain a stable carbon reservoir for the next century and sort of support both adaptation and mitigation. I think the thing that's important for people to keep in mind is not that they should despair and throw up their hands and say nothing can be done. It's that there are things that we don't know how to change. And there, but there are things that we can change. So we can't really dramatically affect the climate change that we're going to experience in the next couple to few decades. But we can dramatically change the prognosis for our children. I'm very happy to have such a great, great group of faculty here in the Sierra Nevada Research Institute. And we can do great things for restoring the Sierra Nevada and bringing more sustainability to our, our region. I work on issues around water sustainability because fresh water is crucial for drinking, growing food, generating energy, and almost every other aspect in our modern life. Future H2O is a research initiative at Arizona State University. It was born out of the White House Water Summit in 2015. The goal of Future H2O is to change the conversation about water from one about scarcity and risk to one about opportunity. Sustainable water practices, I think, are important for industry for uh, a variety of reasons. Number one, uh, all companies want to grow. In order to do that, we have to use the natural resources that we're given wisely and conservatively. The, the second reason, I think, is that one, one of the things we have learned in our journey uh, in sustainability is that we can do a lot by ourselves, but we can do even more with others. And by bringing in other partners, we can find more innovative ways to accomplish our goals. Levi Strauss came to us and said, hey, we do a lot of work in Pakistan. It's where we grow and manufacture blue jeans. And we want to make a difference in terms of water sustainability there. How can, can you help us do that? And so we took the approach um, of saying, well, Levi Strauss is already a leader within the four walls uh, of, their, of their factories. Let's start thinking about how we can make a bigger impact outside the four walls. So the, the area around Lahore in in Upper Pakistan, 
depends largely on groundwater for usage for industrial uses. And the reality is that the usage of groundwater is unsustainable there. The water table is dropping by one meter every year. And so that's why we've teamed up with our partners at Future H2O, Earth Genome, and World Wildlife Fund to create an innovative science-based tool that uses simple maps to show where the risk hotspots are, both kind of a watershed level and a local level. BASIT is a web-based basin assessment intervention tool. BASIT is built based on the first 3D high-resolution basin-scale groundwater flow model for the entire Indus River Basin. With BASIT, we can simulate groundwater dynamics, reveal the influence of climate change and the human activities on water budget. With its help, we can strategically allocate groundwater recharge to improve the basin health. Through BASIT, we really pull together what I consider the key ingredients to a successful partnership. You have the science, the stakeholders, and the solution, and hopefully brought up to a scale that really moves the needle on the ground. I go to water meetings and a water meeting circuit every year. And one of the themes that's often discussed is that the leadership in water is about to retire. One of the things that we think we can do at Future H2O is train that next leadership to be more savvy about how to use data to make better decisions. So the Global Water Classroom is actually one of uh, Future H2O Water Education's first projects that we completed. So in this course, students learn about topics as diverse as the water cycle on Earth and within living organisms, the role that water plays within religion, and how big data presents enormous opportunity to improve water sustainability. We see the sustainability space as a non-competitive space. And so by looking broader at the issue and bringing in multiple stakeholders, we can collectively uh, achieve greater results at a lower cost. One thing that I think would be a very interesting model to explore is the idea of companies who supply and buy from each other to work together. So for example, Intel might use filter products that Dow makes. They might sell Coca-Cola products on their campus. That's a supply chain, all of which needs water, all of which could be co-located in a similar basin, and, and all of whom could collaborate to have a bigger impact. We know that talking about it is not enough. We know that setting targets and that alone is not enough. We need to do more than that. And so that's why we really set our sights on changing the whole apparel industry uh, to, by open sourcing our programs and encouraging industries to follow in our footsteps. Uh, by engaging the private sector through partnerships with different NGOs, we're starting to create science that shows the future and shows a better future. I think once people realize the gravity of our situation in terms of climate change and environmental change, they might feel like we're doomed, like this. It's, uh, it's very stressful and, and they can feel a sense of despair. And this is not what we are teaching our students here. We're teaching that there's a way out of this. It requires a massive investment from our society. It requires everyone to participate, but there's a way out. One of the things that makes this department so unique and a leader is that we bring together people who have different areas of expertise. It's very, very interdisciplinary. I think we have outstanding scholars in our department. That goes back to the time when Ralph Ciceroni formed this department and really picked the top experts in the, in the country in these kind of topics. And I think we kept that legacy to work closely together with a, with a common goal uh, for, for our students and for our research. So I'm an oceanographer. I study photosynthesis in the ocean and biogeochemical cycles, which is basically looking at how climatological changes to the Earth system affect phytoplankton populations. And those are basically the, the tiny microscopic plants that live in the ocean and form the base of the marine food web. My group is one of the most diverse, and it's something that I'm really proud of. The fact that everybody's bringing a different set of tools to the table really brightens up the research and, and explores new avenues that I wouldn't be able to come up with on my own. So 
I work a lot on the risks and vulnerabilities of human systems to global environmental changes and trying to find scalable solutions to mitigate those risks. Wildfires are really interdisciplinary. Um, this department has a really long history of studying fires and in our laboratory we're studying global fires across the whole Earth system uh, using satellite data. In September we published a paper looking, uh, trying to predict the final size of a fire from the time that it ignites. This type of prediction is really important, especially in areas that are responding to strong trends in, in climate. So Shane was able to predict which fires grow really large and that's important because then in a situation where there are a lot of fires on the landscape, the fire managers can triage the problem and select certain fires to limit their damages to ecosystems and keep carbon inside ecosystems. 2019 was a very special year. The Amazon was in the news. Our research group gave almost 200 interviews about what was happening in the Amazon in 2019. And the main problem was that there's an increase in deforestation in the region. And so Brazil pretty much created the biggest bonfire for the past 10 years in the region by burning all this uh, forest that are clear cut. One place where I've realized turbulence really matters is over the Amazon rainforests. Working with ecophysiologists in the department here, I've come to appreciate that the way the physiology of the forest adapts to high CO2 actually changes the energy balance of the surface in ways that spark turbulence feedbacks. So that's opening up new frontier questions at, at the interface of our disciplines that I, I didn't imagine would happen, but I really like that about, about ESS. My name is Murat Aydin. I work with ice cores from polar ice sheets. And we talk about atmospheric CO2 changes, right? We know the last 100 years have been highly unusual. And the reason why we know that is directly linked to the ice core trace gas research that has been done. I study water resources on land and look at how the water storage on land is changed. And that's important because both the ice sheet you know, has impact because it's going to raise sea level and it's going to impact on the population that live in the coastal area. And water storage availability is a big deal. It's very important, it's a big impact. We've seen over the past decades that many glaciers around the coast of Greenland and Antarctica have been thinning, retreating, and their flow have been accelerating, discharging more icebergs into the ocean than before. And we first need to identify what the driver of change is. And what uh, we can use in Merkel models to determine whether it's the ocean, whether it's changes in the atmosphere circ circulation, whether you know, it's the, the topography underneath the ice that's making the ice less or more stable, depending on where we are. One of the main data sets that I use is the one from the GRACE mission, it's a satellite mission. It measures the gravity field of the Earth. It means that it weighs the Earth every 30 days and we see what changes from one month to the other. And I think it provides a unique information about the ice sheet. And it's the first time that we are able to measure the total water store, also including groundwater in remote region as well. Well, part of what we do is educate um, uh, this next generation of, of students and they're supposed to spread the word, they're supposed to spread the knowledge. Uh, we're very proactive also in outreach and, and social media. I sort of started climate communications through social media and I specialize in sort of visualizing climate data through easier to understand graphics. It's not just the advantage of communicating the work, but it's also that you're learning about your own science and how people interpret your work. And I think it's extremely valuable and been very beneficial for my graduate studies. I've worked at a number of institutions and I can honestly say that UCI is the most friendly, receptive, inclusive environment I've ever been in, both in terms of the faculty and the students. We really try to create a community and then provide everybody with what they need to succeed. And in a diverse place, it really adds to have different ideas. We really believe in that. I really feel like our entire discipline is moving in the direction of merging what we know about the physical sciences with the solutions. Engineers have been doing this for a long time, but engineers tend to focus on pretty small scales, whereas we're thinking about it globally. Humans are by now an undeniable part of the Earth system, and uh, that's where we fit.
Here we are on the conference floor asking attendees, how do you hope your work will influence the future of science? Well, I hope that my work in science impacts the future by diversifying science. That's one of my main goals is to diversify it, especially in the geosciences. We don't have such a representation of, we, of in the geosciences that you see in terms of the general population in terms of Hispanic and Latino, African American, so underrepresented minorities. Well, I hope my work will influence the future of science by helping us understand better how volcanic lava flows work. Just recently, we had a large lava flow in Hawaii, but these happen all through geologic time. They're gonna influence society uh, forever. And so we do experiments at Syracuse University pouring large volumes of lava flow, sort of tabletop size experimental lava flows where we can understand their dynamics and how they influence the surroundings. I hope that my work impacts the students that I teach. I have a passion about teaching students and whether they're going to be scientists or they're just going to be citizens of the earth, I want them to understand how the earth works. I hope my work will uh, impact the future of science by understanding the chemical exchange between the crust and the rest of the earth. Uh, there's a slow exchange at uh, mid-ocean ridges as the crust evolves, and then occasionally we have something like a meteorite impact, and uh, you have a sudden exchange of chemicals. So I, I, I hope we understand more about that and how it affects the climate system. That's it for this year in San Francisco and our coverage of the 2019 AGU Fall Meeting. Until next year.